Hello there. Well, um, I just realised that I have not got video from earlier uh, sessions of this guitar. So I've got photographs of it. Um, Andy, I didn't have video of it. I thought I, I thought I had the cameras running and I missed out a chunk, so I haven't. But anyway, here we go. Look, so we've got the Bridge Doctor is fitted. There's the little screw with a little plug. I've got the new slot routed in the opposite direction to the original one. Um, a fraction over wider than I wanted, but not a major problem. I can fill if necessary. We've got the bridge doctor in there, dun, 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 doing its thing. And um, we've discussed today, and we're going to refret this beastie with some Evo gold, which I think will offset the kind of cold gold colours in the edging here very nicely. Um, and ta -da, we are getting in a new fret marker dot, 7mm dot here. So the problem with all of this is I can't really get you a very cleverly placed, a very good, oh, where's my battery? What's the battery saying? How did that happen? Okay, 84%. Well, let's run it like that for a bit, shall we? Um, hmm. And I need to tighten that up. That's not good. <laughs> Sorry. Tighten up. I suppose it's a bit of a better shot than before. Looking long ways, I think that will probably do. And of course, I can always do the zoom in thing. Right, well, look, let's just leave that there for what we're doing just now. Uh, I suppose we could do it with some light as well. Yeah, no, maybe not. That's quite nice light. What the heck? Right, so we've got a 7mm dot and uh, what I'm looking to do is I want to mix up a bit of Araldite um, with a bit of brown, uh, what's that stuff called? Here it is in my hand, burnt umber being, burnt umber being, uh, I've lost my words, acrylic. So Araldite and acrylic does work together. So somewhere I just had uh, a bunch of, <laughs> I had some that stuff, Araldite, and now I've put it down somewhere. Oh, here it is, right. So we're going to mix up a bit of Araldite and a bit of burnt umber. Now this stuff takes quite a while to set. Um, hardener, standard hardener, standard resin. So we mix these together with a bit of the colour in it, and then we'll use that to set that in there. And we want it to stand proud of the surface because um, I want to be able to re-radius this back when the time is right. So one thing I don't know about this neck at the moment is what its closest radius is. So kind of a sort of 12, 12, it's kind of 12, but it's got quite a bit of unevenness. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of flatter than 12 maybe, not really sure. 14 seems a bit much. Actually, it's 14 is probably right. How about that? Well, we've got a 14 inch radius block. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 14 inch radius. That's okay, we can do that. And we can bend the metal, bend the metal, bend the fret metal to 14 as well. Okay, so let's get some Araldite mixed up. Um, I'll try and get all of this from here on in, here in on, here on in. Um, yeah, I've I got, basically I got um, extremely messed up, confused. I did three camera shoots and they were going all over the place so it didn't work out and I lost quite a bit of video footage because I didn't know what was going on. Um, so, now this is unopened, so let's open it, shall we? Uh, have I got any other? Well, I have got some already opened. I don't know. So I've got a. Uh huh. Okay. Manufactured in. It doesn't say a, a use by date. So it has a, a foreign looking price tag on it. We don't need much at all. So let's let's see what we get out of here. Uh. <laughs> 
do. Chuck the rest. Hardener. Equal amounts. And then we're going to mix in a little bit of the ye oldy brown, but not too much to begin with. Oh, blimey, stiff. We don't want to totally upset its setting properties. We just need a bit of colour to make it blend in with the neck. And it's only really for the tiny little bit of resin that will show. I, it's very difficult with the drills I've got to get a perfect hole in here. Um, I'm sorry, I need a little bit of fill around the edges. I'm probably mixing black with that, but I don't think I've got any black resin. Black resin? No, the world world is black. The word is black acrylic. So what I would want is to scrape part of this into the into the hole, and anything that is left over super 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 excessive, whatever the word is I'm looking for, left over. Um, we'll get. Uh, sand it off when this is set. So we have two sides to this and they both look about the same. They'll shine up differently when we sand them down anyway. Pop that on top and basically squishing into the hole. Now that is going to take off most of the excess there, so it's not a huge great pile of material to remove. It's quite. I find it difficult to get this depth exactly right when you do this because. If you go too far, then you end up with um, nothing sticking proud of the surface. And if you stick too much up, um, you can miscalculate and not have enough down in the hole, as it were. So I think that's probably just about right. If I can concentrate on pressing it down a little bit more. Hmm. Fingers crossed, that's about right. Okay, bin that. And we'll put this off to one side. Because that's all I want to do with it right now. And then um, I just want to let it set. A peaceful spot. So uh, for now, we can put it over on. Actually, you know what, we'll probably leave it there because I could probably do with warming up first by doing the wiring for Kenny's scratch plate. So that's probably a better bet so I get warm in this place before I get into the setup. Yeah, good idea, Sam. All right, Sam, I thought so. Right, okay. So that's that little bit of video done and dusted. It's only a tiny bit, but we know where we're at. Okay, go. So then when that's set and everything, we'll pull the frets out and get ready. Uh, it'd be nice to put some Evo gold frets on here. Ooh. Okay, so here we have, we're back again. It's, it's Monday evening and it's time to lift up the fabulous frets off of, off of here and re-radius. So I'm just, uh, the frets haven't, the new frets haven't arrived yet. So there's a bit of, waiting time still to do, but I'm going to, going to make up a little fret pulling tool that I've used before, you may have seen. Um, just kind of using a bit of tape to protect the old fingers a little bit. Oh, that'll do. Not the end of the world. Whoops. <laughs> safe. So we're going to refret this guitar with Evo Gold. Uh, it's not the easiest 
I'm not the best position to reach in and grab this, but the idea is we want to lift these frets out or loosen them to get them moving. So we're going to take them out like this. There you go. And we're going to re-radius this board so it's going to kind of look clean and new when we finish with it. So just getting all of these started and it's really that easy. I, I've uh, I think I might buy another um, fret lifting pliers, but actually this is, funnily enough, this low-tech approach is the cleanest way I've found yet to remove frets. Um, my concern is that a lot of the fret, or the fret lifting pliers that I've used, um, start by putting a, a bit of damage or putting some damage on the uh, on this edge and so you get a kind of compression damage which I don't like at all um, <clears throat> here I'm using the thinness of the blade to get under the f under the fret crown um, where it can there's a bit, a bit of grime getting in the way there but we get under the if we can get underneath there you go underneath and then proceed to lift it with a little twist um, and that way I, I sort of get the fret starting to move like this without any damage to the edge whatsoever uh, and I find for me that's a pretty useful way of doing it now with this guitar it's going to require <clears throat> it's got the uh, Got the bridge doctor in there, El Doctoro, and we're going to need to. Uh, what are we going to need to do? We're going to need to do some um, fret work. So I'm going to just place down <clears throat> some tape here to just give me some confidence that I can <clears throat> use the. Uh, Repro re what am I calling it? <laughs> the radius block to resurface uh, this. Um, that's what I want to be able to do. And so I'm going to just protect it with that green frog tape. Now I can, uh, I can put, once I've got this green tape on here, I can also put some uh, Gorilla tape on there if I want greater protection. And it's actually quite good to do that. It's only sticking to this green stuff and the green stuff is quite, forgiving on finishes of any kind so you can see I'm doing a twisting motion with this device here to get the fret started to lift and I'm, I'm doing it very carefully so that I don't break the blade if possible there you go on the um, on the knife on the, on the snap off blade but I've got cuts and I've got knackered wrist from gardening stuff yes oops there you go I didn't want to break that but uh, I've got gardening strain on my wrist because I'm not used to it. So sad sap. Anyway, so now, unlike an electric guitar, I'm kind of running out of a bit of room to manoeuvre here, but it's still lifting them. Okay. Still using the same twist approach. So I'm, you know, I'm on one, still on the first inexpensive blade. Now I am a little bit out of room here, so this might get a little bit more difficult to do. Um, uh, well, it would be easier now if I take out the previous fret. So let's let's just get on with that. So I, I can use my old fret pullers. Um, not that I like them very much, but let's let's use them to gently nibble out the frets behind the one I'm working on so that I just got a bit of a bit of an easier go at it. The frets I've ordered for this are um, not very tall so I'm keeping it as original to these this feel as possible because in many ways this guitar feels very nice to play so I don't want to I don't want to make too profound a change anyway. That's what happens. And it breaks eventually. 
but we shall introduce get another one in the mix. This is a good way of reusing all these old blades. Not really good for much. You might look at it and think, is that why you've got great knife splits on your thumb? And the answer is possibly could have something to do with it. But it's not the only reason. Anyhow, so today's world news Harry and Meghan. No, I didn't say anything about Harry and Meghan. <laughs> I had a, a, an interesting Zoom uh, I don't know, course, you got online Zoom course today. I've been lucky enough to get some local, regional, free business support. Uh, you know, to to take part in or to, to you know to take part in some workshops on things and you know get a bit of business help which is it's actually nice really nice to there, that there's some uh, resources out there but anyway one of, one of these was a uh, uh, today was a Instagram and uh, Facebook advertising thing and uh, um, this is now it's proving to be quite difficult this bit because I don't have any room yeah I don't have any room to twist so how am I going to do this? I'm going to have to use the original, what's it, the original, these. Um, and I don't really want to go from the, well, I can go from any edge. Normally I would avoid the, this playing edge if I was using these because the, um, uh, if I were to make any, get any sort of slight dents on the edge, I wouldn't want them in that space. But truth is, I'm going to re-radius this. Uh, fingerboard anyway so it's we can, we can we have the luxury of cleaning up any slight marks that we might or might not get anyway so there you go that's a nice bit of protection for the and uh, the body it's slightly difficult because that's actually not too bad of a start point but you have to use quite a lot of downward force on these pliers as well as inward force and then then you're sort of pulling out fairly crudely um yeah so i i, I was part taking part in this zoom course today which was kind of interesting um you know it's very difficult to kind of when you go take part in something like that that's a free resource it's often you can find it might not be pitched at the level that you feel is, is useful to you um, and in this case um, I it, it started out being mostly a sort of 101 on marketing for small businesses which can be very gen you know is often very generalistic um, by by default I suppose um, but it didn't, it didn't it's a struggle to find it useful. Um, you know, and, and there were some, there were some people in, uh, in the class or in the, on the thing who were um, sort of, were, were starting businesses or had started businesses, but were really unsure how to define even who they're, market was you know um, which, which seemed quite a long way off um, what I needed I was much more I suppose I needed to know more about the mechanics of the differences between Facebook and Instagram if any and um, you know, the sort of mechanics of the interface you know the, the advertising interface and I suppose it will ultimately It'll have to come down to just trying it out. I've done a, I did a little bit of Facebook advertising in the past, and it, it, I found it partly my in my own fault in inverted commas. I find it quite. I found it quite difficult to measure any return on the investment of time and money doing it. I didn't spend much. It was just interesting to see how it worked, um, and I think that that's one of the biggest problems. Um, but one, one thing I did notice was that it, it really felt that the approach being 
this talked about was quite, I suppose, 2000s-ish or 1990s transferred into 2021. And I think, I think that that's such a big gap of time, sort of technologically in terms of somewhere social media is gone, that I don't, I'd like for example, uh, and it's not, I'm not, it's not a critique of the course running or pe the people who ran the course because you know it's, it's a, a very well meaning and stuff but the idea that you would advertise in anything like an old familiar way you know so they were talking about you know designing ads so that they catch somebody's eye and, and all the usual sort of graphic design 101 stuff and i know that because i used to teach it back in around the turn of that century and um you know, and in a way, that was that was a how advertising worked at the end of the sort of print era, I suppose. But um, so you know, the, the the idea that you take that idea of putting, you know, creating visually appealing ads targeted to catch your intended market or intended customer's eye um, in a medium where actually. By and, by and large, people don't want to be uh, intruded on by advertising. You know, and YouTube's a great example. That it, I can't see anybody will look back in history and say that YouTube advertising worked for them in any way, shape or form. I just can't see it. It's grudge advertising. Uh, you know, and the best, the best, it seems that anybody got out of it was you forced somebody to listen or look at your thing for a certain period of time until they could click off, um, which is not at all an ideal <laughs> situation to be in. Um, I can't see how that benefits an advertiser. Anyway, um, so, so the, the, you know, to even approach, um, to even approach Facebook or uh, that thing, Instagram, you know, with the with the idea of adverts in your head. Okay, where's my side metal mate? Yeah, with the idea of sort of adverts as a conventional thing in your mind seems just I don't know, seems quite quite wrong. Wow, holy cow! Right, that's that's working. I just want this flat before I do any surface work on the fingerboard. Yeah. So anyway, because. You know, I've just had that experience of thinking about and looking at um, uh, YouTube ads for a while, um, you know, having been sort of subjected to uh, having put up with them like everyone has done in, you know, in using YouTube. Uh, and then eventually, you know, I, I decided to go over to paying for the, uh, the unadvertised version and the reason I did that um, actually is partly because I just, I think the ad supported model is embryonic. It's a kind of an infancy model of revenue monetization, you know, um, in, you know put in place because it, it wasn't a mature enough industry or medium to know how to monetize it. Uh, and so that's not bad, it's pretty flat. You know, so it, you kind of default to, in its infancy of this new technology, you default to a, a familiar type of revenue model. You know, you go, well, we'll we've got people's eyeballs in front of screens, so we'll charge an advertiser um, money to put their content in front of an unwilling, more or less unwilling uh, crowd. Um, and I just think that's clearly not a model that's going to work, but it... it yeah, you know, it's obviously they, that's what they had to do. Wow, I tell you something, the the, the gouges. In, thank you. The gouges in this. Uh, I'll take some close-up pictures. I think the gouges in that neck are absolutely fingerboard, absolutely incredible. Um, let's see if I can get some pics. They're so so deep. But you know, in some ways, this is a this is a great vintage mojo, and some people. Um, you know, I prefer to keep this in place because you can refret and leave this in place. It's not at all impossible, but uh, Andy wanted this extra 
dot adding and the only real way to add a dot is to uh, be able to re-radius the board afterwards otherwise you'll get it slightly sticking out one way or another either it will be sunken or it will be sticking out the only way to get it to fit the radius is to um, is to take a block to it and be able to re-radius and that's what I'm going to do in the first instance though what I want to do is take down this excess on here because it's we've got too much and it's it's going to be a little bit proud of the surface but also the aerodite is as well so um, we'll take it down as flat as possible to begin with um i wasn't sure how i've actually got this deep enough into here and it may be that it's it may not work and i may have to replace it if it's not deep enough but that's not going to be a problem since i've got a fair number of these pearl seven millimeter things anyway yeah so kind of uh i just kept finding finding myself thinking you know i, I thought the, the the course leaders comments on um you know some stuff was very very you know useful stuff general advertising stuff about knowing who your market is was was a kind of vital business um you know all around business stuff but i think i needed more more of a sort of more of an up-to-date insight into not so much how you make adverts in the sort of late 20th century approach, but how to, how, you know, tricks or not tricks, um, you know, good tips for using um, Instagram and Facebook for not advertising, but for building audiences. And I suppose um, when it's all said and done, uh, I suppose I've, I've been doing that anyway. So maybe it isn't something that I needed too, you know, too urgently. I don't know. But it just left me wishing I could, uh, wishing I could, we could discuss uh, these things. So I've got my 14 inch radius block, which is what this is. And it's going to clog up pretty quickly, so I'm going to have my um, brass declogger standing by. I, mean, I can I cut some new uh, some new stuff, new stuff, new paper again. I'll just start off over this one. So the key thing I found out about um, refretting is preparation of the surface. You know, so um, I'm just going to double check this, but I'm pretty sure I was confident that it was 14 yesterday, and it should still be 14. Yeah, it's 14 with a, a little bit of raised edge because it's worn a lot in the middle and not right on the edge. Funnily enough, because your fingers don't touch right on the edge. Um, yeah, so thing about getting a good refret is always preparation of the surface and in this case the surface is very pitted from years of finger uh, juice <laughs> not put too fine a point on it um, so we're taking all of this dark uh, at the moment dark grease out of the mix um, and we'll end up eventually with a lot, much lighter looking, newer looking fingerboard, which will darken with oil to restore it. We will need to, we need to cut down a fair bit. You'll see eventually when 
these grooves are left. Now I know, on, like I said, on a lot of old guitars it's considered a mark of kind of mojo to have that stuff on there. And it, you know, I'm totally with that on <clears throat> many, many guitars only, you know, because we've got this extra dot to build in or get involved in the fit into the family, then it needs to be sanded back flush at the correct radius. Otherwise it just, <clears throat> just ends up being a, a uh, something that looks like it's been fitted in badly at a later date. with I'm using quite a chunky grit we'll, we'll lighten it up <clears throat> as we go through and once we've got the bulk of the wood sanded so that we're down to the shape and level that I want um, you can see it's quite nice under there nice um, a nice grain to it but really deep holes here um, you, you know if they were really deep and you were worried about the amount of material you've got available you could fill them a little bit but the problem with that is they'll really stand out so if we're going to go for a, a thing that looks clean and new all over which we're sort of where we're going then it's best to go down to the level of those holes now i'm going to uh, fret this guitar with end fills so I will, I will overhang the cut the, the frets um, and I will fit in end fills um, and the reason for that is I uh, part of the reason for that is I want to be able to sand um, sorry cut recut these slots as much as possible so to be able to run a saw into the slots gives me a chance to clean them out um, much better than trying to work within uh, you know within a an end fill so there's no reason to keep the end fills because I can put them on afterwards and, and actually we can um, we can put some if we need to we can put some poly some more poly over the edge I've already put some on oh no I haven't put it on here I'm going to wait till we've done this so we're going to put some more poly on the edge here um, and we can do more of that when we've finished the refret oh sorry yes no yeah should we do it yeah we'll do it yeah, we'll, we'll finish the poly after we've filled the ends and put some poly over the edge, over the fills, I should say. So you can see we're slowly getting to the point of cleaning up and you can see the real deep spots up there. There's a little flat spot down there that's showing up, which is quite interesting, but nothing surprising. It's kind of, it's probably a, just an inherent in the neck itself. Looking good, everything's fine. The truss rod is currently at um, slack at the moment, so we wouldn't get any more curvature into it, even if I took it right off slack. So we're working within that constraint at the moment but it looks pretty good and this this fixed piece of 80 grit I think it is or 60 I think it's 80 seems to be doing a fairly good job of re-radiusing and I really want to keep using this until we've got everything cut down to fresh wood um, obviously the, the challenge is going to be more at this end and we have to consider how far you need to go down into there. Um, but the question is, if we focus too much on just that end, then we get a kind of tail off or, or wedge or thinning of the neck at this end. So we have to try not, you know, try and, you know, uh, do everything equally or a uniform leveling across the whole neck. I do love it when we kind of re reinvigorate um, an old fingerboard. 
at the moment it'll also when you do that it also becomes very sharp at the edge so you want to be able to shortly we'll we'll just round off the edges a little bit but uh that's quite deep there i mean in the past i've made the decision to stop and leave some of the, the the kind of corrosion in the fingerboard in there only because to to keep taking it away uh, is a, sac a sacrifice of a lot of material from elsewhere that isn't strictly necessary. Um, I would say with this guitar, it's, it's not it's not a critically thin fingerboard that I'm too worried about. So, or I'm not. We're looking at the fret dots here coming out or anything like that. Um, but it's a judgment call all the way. Um, you know, this refretted and cleaned up will still feel great. Um, and, you know, we'll, we may end up with a bit of that still in there. Um, looking at the thickness of the board, there's actually more thickness available, I would say at this end anyway, just by the way that they built it in the first place. So we can actually afford to cut down a little bit further here than the other end anyway, so that's good. say that and then the last kind of micrograms of wood take forever oh, isn't that gorgeous yeah it's nice to see new fresh wood come up even though it's nice to also have the vintage feel you know the original wear and all the stories it had to tell Bet you it still rings like a bell. The end is a bit a bent on the open G chord side there. A, you know, somebody's played a lot of open Gs in the past. So that's, a, that's kind of worn that edge away a little bit. But it's still, still getting there. Oh yeah, very nice. Brand new. You know, and the other thing about being able to do this, of course, is when you do clean up a board like this, the, the experience when the owner gets it back is such a profound difference to what they remember. Now, there are some ups and downs about that. You know, as a tech or a luthier or whatever you call yourself, uh, you have to be conscious of the fact that a refretted and um, re radiced guitar can feel so different that actually it may not always be that the difference is a pleasant surprise. Um, you, not saying it isn't it usually is but I think you have to be you have to be kind of conscious of the fact that it may not automatically be the wonderful experience that you imagine it will be as you're doing this um, because it is in all said and done it is a big difference to what it was before it's the nature of how big a change you make in doing a re radius and refret. So it's very rarely, I, I've never actually had a problem with that, but I always, I always do, when somebody says or mentions that, what they want, I often still say, you do realize how different it'll be, don't you? Um, and most people are fine with it. So we're nearly there at this. So since we're so close to being where we want to be, and since there's a lot of <coughs> a lot of 
uh, fingerboard at this end, we can still carry on. But yeah, it's, don't underestimate how big a difference it can make. Um, you know, it's, it's profound, the difference we make when we do something like this. So obviously when, uh, when I get the saw out into action a bit later on, um, we're going to cut down the slots and we need to have a depth gauge set on it so that you know, we're, we get to the correct depth. Um, now the, oh, what I don't instantly know is what the actual um, tang depth will be, but we can be fairly confident that, you know, we, we need enough to, for it to work, put it that way. So what we'll end up doing is gently drawing the saw through the existing slot. Um, and that will take out the end fill as well. But it's nice to be able to do that because we can, we can get the whole slot perfectly clean. Um, we'll carry on backwards and forwards in with different grades of sandpaper and finally end up by sanding this out, uh, sorry, you know, cleaning out the slots right up to the moment that we uh, start to refret. Because having those frets seating properly is, is absolutely critical. That's the most important, almost the most important, one of the very most important parts of the refret process. And getting that, getting the surface right and getting the frets to seat right. Because if they don't, then you'll end up with uneven frets. Uh, with the fretting process, you'll have some uneven frets full stop because it's impossible to um, impossible to sort of get a set of frets in absolutely, uh, you know, millimeter microscopically perfect. It's impossible to do that just, just by hitting them in. So there's always a degree, a little bit of fret leveling required, but uh, how much is dictated by the preparation of the surface and the slots and the frets. So all those, all those parts are critical to getting a good, well-seated set of frets, which should then make the leveling process quite relatively simple. Now with a guitar like this, the question as with many guitars I do is would I, what glue will I use for the refret? And uh, I prefer if the if the tang, if the slot and the tang match up well, and they feel like they're kind of well matched for width, which I don't see a reason why they won't be because of the fact that I bought fret wire very close to the dimensions of this existing wire. So if they matched well, then we should be able to uh, refret with wood glue as a sort of insurance just to kind of hold things that extra bit snug. Um, we're so close there, so there's about three little patches of uh, corrosion still left. At this sort of stage in the game, it would be a shame to leave those there um, when everything else is now new and clean looking. So I'm just, I'm just doing this gratuitously for fun, this slot cleaning. I'm gonna fill them up again with dust in a minute as they carry on fret leveling, but it's a nice, nice feeling. Be very, very careful on the first bit where you put the saw in that you, you get it to find its natural fit in the slot. It's quite easy to push too much on it before it's found its place in the slot. And if you do that, you can quite easily scour, scour, score, score down the side. So the first time you use the, the uh, thing, and here you've got, of course, you've got to and froing that you can't really afford to do. So this is much more about keeping the, the, uh, the 
sort of straight as you come through and kind of expect it to run out a bit at the far end so just sort of try and control the angle as it comes out very difficult to control but but the same you know the same applies here as to anywhere it's got to be clean the slots have to be clean for you to refret so i'm kind of using the back of the saw here just so i can kind of see where it's at and control it so then once i've got this guiding groove slot i will fit the rest of the blade a bit more in there just to get all the way through and keeping it flat so we're taking out the little fill at the end here but we're not risking running and if you were nervous you could add some more tape right out to the edges here but there we have it so if you can see we're not far off and you can see by this end here that those little dips here we i mean it would still be a lovely guitar if we just went with that but i think we've got enough um, room or enough material to to allow us to take out see if we can completely take out those bits of corrosion and of course the whole workshop is now full of rosewood dust there so and then once we're there really it's just a matter of going up a few light grades just to um you know tidy up the, the grain tidy up the, the sanding marks so we end up with a nice smooth surface Two tiny little marks there, really. That's, that's all there is left. You possibly hardly even noticed them once it was oiled. But there's one and one. Very close. Need to remember the rest of it. Great sandpaper, this Hyromant stuff. Um, you know, it's one block, uh, one piece that's been stuck to that block for quite some time. Um, and it's still cutting really well. Oh, that's lovely. That's almost, almost there. I think it's worth just persevering with. Otherwise it'll be, oh, you left a little bit. That's my inner critic, by the way. It's not that Andy won't be saying that to me. Why did you leave that little bit? For the sake of a twentieth of a mil of rosewood, you left a blemish. How could you have? I think we are, we are almost there. That's it, it's all out. There's a tiny ding on the edge, which I've already filled a bit, and that will, that will clear that up with um, that stuff. Uh, the poly, actually, we come to fill it. 
Now I'm going to use a little bit of 240 uh, just to uh, round off the edges here, soften the edges. And then I'll go and get some different grades of sandpaper. This is one reason why having the uh, protection on the guitar top there is a good idea. So there's my slightly rounded off edge. Still quite sharp. This is a very a fairly fine sandpaper. So it's not how much you round it, it comes ultimately down to your own preference. I don't know too many people who like a really sharp fingerboard edge. feel all of this. Now I'm going to get some uh, a bit of 180, well 120 will do actually. Not a very well torn off bit of one, 120. <clears throat> I'm going to do a bit of 120 a couple, just to help clean up the board and then we'll go to 240 and then 600. Now this is not glued to it, so this is a looser fit and I don't want to be cutting so much with this because it wouldn't be quite as accurate a radius, but it's good just to keep, to keep the, get rid of the scratches from the 80. And that's really all I want to do with it there. And then we'll go 240. So untidy, it's ridiculous. I need some hanging things, really. Right, 240, and then I'll go 400, and then I'll probably stop on 400. I don't want it to be ultra polished, it's not that sort of thing. I think one of the places you'll notice the fine finishing grip more is going to be on the mother of pearl inlay parts. Um, actually, they're all looking pretty good, but that's where you'll you'll notice or you'll see bigger scratches if you don't tidy them up. It's a slightly different. This is a prettier mother of pearl than the other ones. They're more like plastic dots, but this this extra one here is is very nice. So again, I'm not, <clears throat> not going to do much of that, and I'm going to switch to a 400 grip sheet, if I can get it out of the box, and then sort of be ready to sit and wait for the frets to come in. We've got Elixir's strings here, ready for uh, these three acoustics. I've got uh, the Takamine down there, this is Washburn, and also Gibson at home, which is requiring a setup as well. The 400 grit now is sort of smoothing off a business. Again, we'll just go over the edges again with rounding off with this 400 because even this can put a an edge back on. That's looking uh, as a dry piece of wood with no oil in it. That's looking fab. So it's going to look beautiful by the time we finish it all off. Um, yeah. So with the 400 grit, let's just go up the edge, both sides, help round off.
feels great. <clears throat> now often what I use for cleaning out the slots is the sort of the reverse of a blade tip, which is uh, very good. So I think I've sort of scraped my way to clean slots here and then I, once I've got the slots cleaned out, I could use the blade again, uh, the saw again, just just make finally sure that it's all cleaned out. Now, once I've done this, since I'm not gonna do any more sanding, there shouldn't be any reason why these slots get filled up with anything again. Um, so they should be good up to the point of refretting. But it never hurts to do that extra step again. Um, what I'm gonna do, by the way, just to give myself a peace of mind, I'm gonna go right to the edge of this with both the green tape and a bit of Actually, green tape would be enough, I was going to say, a bit of the old gorilla, but green's enough. Yeah, so, you know, if you're not certain, can't remember if you've cleaned out the slots just before you come to refret, then don't risk it, clean them out again. Now, I used to have cans of compressed air, which are quite cool to have around. I might just get some, actually, but it seems like a an environmentally unsound pastime. Um, so if you're going to do this, you could kind of make sure that the uh, edges here, you can get down into them by just tilting forward and you can see where the end of the saw is going and you can see if it's going to cause any problems by hitting the surface, which is also protected. So you can get the sort of forward part. And that's good for making sure, by the way, that the, uh, the slot is deep enough right at the edge, which sometimes can be a problem. So I'm kind of going a little bit over the top on the forward bit on the edges, just to make sure. I'd rather have more slot depth there than too little, because it's the too little that will make the fret ends stand up. Um, and if that's the case, then that's gonna cost me uh, a ton of time in leveling and also a, a load of unnecessary fret metal to get them <clears throat> get them down to uniform playing height which ideally we would have just by the fact that they're the correct depth to begin with so you can see i'm coming over the other side making sure the middle's cleaned out and then make sure that it's deep enough on the far side this is causing a little bit of pull out not pull out exactly but it makes a little you can feel where it's breaking the some of the finish on the edge but that's okay because we can sand that and refinish it which i'm planning to do anyway because we put dots down in there new dots so we want to cover those up and make them part of a, a finish a guitar like this i'll do that part of the thing with wipe on poly I, I find that a nice easy to use easy to manage home refinishing stuff you know, it's it's non-toxic mostly uh, it's very easy to use at home you can do a little bit go watch the tv do something else come back um, and, and you can just do a little bit as you pass by each time and I like that approach. Um, so I, I tend to take a guitar like this that needs that, doing it home and do it over a couple of days and then everything's done and good. A little bit of flake there, but that's okay. Now I'm just gonna pay attention to the end, ends here and the depth of the thing. Now, ideally, I would like my little guide to reach right over to this back end and it doesn't. So I'm sort of making up the depth a bit here, but like I said, um, I would much rather it be deeper than not deep enough. I can always fill the extra space, but if it's not deep enough, I'm going to know it when it comes to having to take away fret metal to get the frets down to the correct. Oh, you know what I mean. Levelness. Right. There, ladies and friends, that's, a, that's an incredibly, what's the word? I don't know, whatever the word is now. Um, but it was such a nice old expression, ladies and gentlemen. And I know that an inclusive modern version would be everyone. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, everyone. 
Okay, so you see what I just did there? You see what I just did there? I am um, having done the sort of thing with the saw, which sort of puts little skid marks as it goes across. I've just hand sanded uh, with the 400 grit. Um, and of course that's probably, as you can see there now, that's definitely put some dust back in. So, I'm, and you can see I'm pulling stuff out here, even though I've just done the saw. So this is my kind of, probably my final run through. And you see the bits that are coming out. Now it, it does try and chip out at the far end sometimes. It's very difficult to get the whole thing cleaned through without that. And you can get to the end and then try not to yank it through so much. But I'm really, you can see the stuff coming out of these slots. So that even in hand sanding, that's the stuff that's gone back in. And that would still get in the way of the fret seating properly. So I think the last thing you want to do before you fret is a final back of blade scrape out, mate. And you can see I'm, I'm getting quite a bit of detritus. But once I can feel that once I've gone through and cleared each of these frets, I'm kind of confident at that point that everything's good. I've got a, the right surface here. Uh, I could now, uh, I've got the right surface by the way, and I've got the right cleaned out slots. So those are the two principal considerations I would have to making sure that the new frets seat properly. Um, Feel it clagged up a bit at this end, so I need to be quite careful to get everything out here. If it wants to, it's trying to, it's sort of condensed the uh, dust at one end of this these slots. So I'm going to turn it around, go out of vision, and just pull it back from this end. Make sure I've got that cleaned out adequately. I can, I can feel that's nice and sorted now. And I'll do the same for the other side here. Um, especially in this inaccessible bit up by the body. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of little tiny bits of chip out from the, uh, from the, what do you call it, the ends, and that's where the fill comes out. But having said that, I can, uh, I can take this back a little bit now with 400 grit and just smooth all of that out. We've got some burn-in sticks, which are great for um, filling little holes at the end of the, the, the slots. So that will be, be what we'll do. Um, okay, again, so even having done that, now I've got some more stuff, dust built up in the slots. So I still want to take those out, but this time it'll come out sort of easily without any chip out. So the nice deep slots, I'm confident that they will be in good shape for refretting. And that is as much as I can do to prepare the neck, the fingerboard I should say, for refretting. And having taken the time to do this, that puts me, and it stands me a very good chance of getting a great refret. And one that will be fairly straightforward. I won't have to worry. I can get my glue ready. There's a little dent there. Is that dent? No. I get, get the glue ready and I can pretty much tap home all the frets, give them a, you know, a little extra press down and then be confident that they'll be set by the morning and ready to go. So quick close up. That's all, whoops, some bits in there. Uh, it's all looking great. Very fresh. I don't know how well that comes out on this camera. Brand new board. I mean, I could put some oil on it now just to show you how great that rosewood is going to look, but I won't. And the reason I won't is because I want this oil free for the fretting process. I don't want to end up um, the frets not sticking or, or not sitting in where they should. Okay, so that's it for this preparation. Next stop will be, I'm going to throw that away. Next stop will be um, when the gold Evo gold frets arrive. And I'll transfer over to the fretting station, which will be tidy by then, and we'll get on.
Okay, so a bit of a tidy up now. Uh, and that's it for this one for today. Thanks for watching. Here we have it. Uh, I suppose I need to get uh, the charger a minute. Hold on. Right, the time has come to cut fret, baby, Ooh, and refret this washburn. And it's a great pleasure to be doing this because a lot of room in here actually. Um, it's a great pleasure because it's it's uh, giving um, giving this old guitar a new lease of life, which is a, a really nice thing to do. Now, if I drag this wire around here, it's probably going to intrude into the picture. Get that out of the way there. Get one more behind there. Sort of, kind of. Well, hopefully that will stay out of the way. Well, you can see what's going on there. Uh, so the fun and games. Now, let's have a look. We need some things. We need some things before we go any further. We need uh, a container. Oh God, this is a mess in here. We need to clear up. We need a good whole day doing no work, just clearing up, he said to himself, hopefully. Right, let's get a little container for the glue. The glue, here's the container for the glue. We need some glue. Do -do 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 -do. Bloop. We're gonna need a wet cloth and some kitchen roll. So a wet cloth, this yellow one will have to do. Oh, that's all I've got walking around. Bear with me. Cold wet cloth. quite interesting that I didn't have to cut these, uh, bend these frets at all. They were actually just a fraction hair's breadth over 14 inch radius, which, sorry, that is over, no, no, less than, no, oh my God, uh, more than, no, less than. And so it's a little bit, a little bit tighter than 14 inch radius, but for my purposes, that's probably just about right. Because uh, that's do me just fine. Right, so what I've got is our, <clears throat> whatever you can see here, I've got my Evo Gold fret wire. And I guess the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut me a set of frets. Um, so my here, I've got my cutters. So this is a little bit tricky when it's round, big round piece like this. So it's sort of, I'm sort of guessing the length a little bit and it would probably be a little bit wasteful in the process. Um, so I'm just going to start out with, oh, doesn't that feel good? Start out with, don't really want to bend them out of shape whilst trying to save wire, if you get what I mean. Not a problem or not an issue on a neck when you take the, the neck off, the removable neck. So I'm being a bit bit careless with the amount of material used but there's plenty of uh, fret wire here on a um is this a 20 fret neck i can't i can't figure it out so we'll we'll have loads left over so straight off i'm cutting the uh, individual pieces and we'll get a bit tighter to the uh, correct length i mean I, I can mark these off and cut them in a minute once we've got this all in place and then we can trim them down and the secret of all of this I found is um, leaving as little work as possible to be done on board the guitar because we've got not much room here you're not going to get up there with a um, with the beveling file I don't think so you have to get that bit done sort of freehand first there you go so now we have a, a cleaner run at it so each of these now, I'm going to do an overhang cut, um, which is a neat, nice little way to allow me to fill the ends um, in the sort of classic manner, classic, the traditional manner. So I don't need much more, hardly any more than the length of this, but we'll trim and get cl closer as we go along. 
it feels like it's seating beautifully well already. And here we have Evo Gold, and you can probably see from where you are, it's a lovely gold colour. Lives up to its name. It's a it's a little bit harder than, or maybe two or three times harder than regular uh, fret metal, and. I don't quite know what its composition is, but it's it's a little bit more brittle as a result, um, a little bit harder on tools, but not anywhere near as much as stainless steel is on a tool. So um, I don't really have any worries about using Evo Gold. A bit overhanging here, but that's fine. Now what you end up with is, um, end up with, an odd sized piece usually that you can't do anything with but that's uh, just how it goes you get to waste it yeah it, i mean it feels like already it just feels like a good good nice fit oops um so i don't sense we should have any problem tapping this in now the technique i shall use being this is being a, a fixed neck or glued in neck if you like um, i'm going to use a tapping with wood blocks method which i've used many times before uh thing is with a neck like this that's glued in and you haven't got access to this part of the neck with a press you can do the first part of the neck with the press but you actually don't get access to that much with the press so you end up with a neck that's been fretted in two completely different approaches, um, which can introduce a different sort of clamping pressure or a different different fretting pressure. I prefer to do it all, all in the same manner so that um, whatever happens, I'm gonna just lose, I'm gonna do something that I've realized that I need to do a few times before. I'm gonna lose the first, uh, first and last pieces of this wire. I didn't do it on the first bit, so we might, might come back to that but i think we've got enough excess hanging over the edges to do away with it but notice that on these bits of wire that the first and last or the ends of the wire tend to be have a little flat spot on them where by definition as it goes into the bender the wire bender it can't actually bend the wire properly so the first bit as it's as it's going through it's going past the first of the wheels the first of roller bearings if you like and the first bit is often uh, just slightly flatter than everything else. And I think in this case, because we're going a little bit tighter anyway, I think it's probably okay. But um, it's hard to hard to say. But we've got no shortage of this stuff for an acoustic neck on this order. You have to kind of get two lengths of it to make it work, to, to be sure of having enough. But um, that tends to, on an acoustic, that gives you a bit of spare. <laughs> Okay, so I honestly can't see what you can see, so I'm sort of just pulling this around a bit and hoping it looks okay. Right, so how are we going to do this? Well, the first thing I'm going to need, I'm going to need to support the neck at some point when I'm tapping. I need my hammer, I need the blade, I need the cloth, I need the, and it's wooden blocks. And actually, I've got some handmade wooden blocks that I use for this, and I'll show you any second now. They're up here somewhere. Oh, look, and there's one. They're not actually that exotic, so I won't, I won't waste your time showing you all of them. But this little oak block, very crudely made, but it actually happens to have a 14 inch radius attached to it. Now, I need to get one other thing uh, my tang nipper, as they call it. Sorry where it's gone. Where is the tang nipper? There it is. And I suppose I need a pen to be marking the frets with. Right, here we are. Right, so, um, so that again, this is, this is my soldering department, so it's all a bit cluttered up with soldering supplies at the moment, which aren't helping the process too much, but it's not the end of the world. Right, so we're tucked away nicely. So the thing I'm going to do is I tend to start off one of my correct things right. Start off by undercutting one end. Now I get little tang nippers and I snip the undercut part. And what I do is I then seat that down 
in the oops, in the slot with a little bit left over. Now, uh, what I really want is enough to cut off. I mean, I can, actually no. Let's go. How can we see? Yeah, we can see this. But right, let's go flush. Keep keep the amount of work to a minimum on this part. So we're going to get we have cut the under overcut overhang. Uh, and there's my neighbour Kevin downstairs who's making his Land Rover. And so what I'm what I'm looking to do is in fact I'll do all of these sides first. So I'm trimming an un, an overhang. So I'm taking the tang off by a millimetre or two or three on each of these pieces, and I'm just going to seat them here close to the air. Actually, what I also want to do is make sure that they're nice and flush. So I trim them, put them in, square them up to the end like that. And I don't want, I want them sticking out a tiny bit. I want just enough to bring it back flush. So tang remove, square the end with this nice clippers, cutters, which are already wearing. They're already falling apart. That's incredible. Uh, I think the first set I ever bought were probably Stumac ones and they lasted about six years. These replacement ones uh, are going to die within a year by the looks of it, if that. But they're good, they do, they're good in the sense that they get very flush to the edge. So what I'm doing is I'm just placing all of the left hand sides first, um, getting them nicely flush to the edge. If anything, with just a tiny fraction of overhang but hardly any, and then this this end, this clipping this end is just to trim it so it's as square as it can be. Place them in there, it's looking great, if I may say so myself. Cut the end and trim, and we're gonna go all the way down this side, and then I'm gonna mark all of them down this side and cut them short and undercut them on that side as well. And this one's almost exactly the size it needs to be. So it's a slow and painstaking, but like I said, it's all the preparation you do beforehand is critical to ensuring that your frets seat properly. Um, and the more time you take to get the bulk of this sort of preparatory work done, that's interesting, that's twisting or something. What's that? Something's bouncing. Yeah, the more preparatory work you do, the better the, the fret fretting is going to be. There you go. Um, and the less uh, trimming we're going to have to do. The trimming bit is a sort of quite a rough thing, um, and it's easy. It's where you're going to you're likely to get damage if anywhere. So the less, the least, least of it, little, least of it. <laughs> The not much of it you can do, the better. As little as possible. These feel quite loose fitting, so I'm just gonna have a, a, a looky feel as we go along. These are, they should be pretty much the same gauge, but we have done a fair bit of cleaning out of the slots, so that can widen them a little. Um, I'm confident that a bit of wood glue will be enough to hold these in place but we'll we'll tap one in a bit later on we'll get a feel as the first one goes in will be a pretty good uh, assessment of it um, and if if I find that when the first one goes in it really is too loose um, then we may want to look at two one of two things we can either revert to using some super glue which will really kind of keep it set nicely in place and prevent any springing up um, or uh, we can do a little bit of tang twisting. Now you can buy a little tool that widens the fret tang. Actually, this is almost perfectly fitted. I'm careful not to cut the other end at all. Yeah, you can um, you can get a little tool that makes a little mark in the tang to widen it. Um, what I've tended to do because I don't have that tool, I have tended to. Um, use another tool to twist the tang a little bit and that uh, kind of thickens it out and gives it that added grip that you, you might need. So I remember I said that this this area up here is really critical that these are trimmed and actually beveled um, 
from the outset. We don't want to be trying to bevel them while they're on the uh, sitting on the guitar because there's no access. Access. So as you see, it's a bit of an uncomfortable fretting position because I'm standing up doing this. But so the next bit after this will be marking the other side, going down, trimming them all off. Then these top ones, what I'll do is I'll get a Dremel with a sanding disc uh, and I will Dremel the, oops, I'll Dremel the uh, bevel angle onto them or I'll, I'll bring the, I'll bring the um, fret up to the drum and I'll get a, a angle cut onto it, onto the fret and then we'll get as close to being done as possible. In that way, including not only the bevel uh, angle but also the overall length, we'll make sure it's spot on. So we can just tap these in and really not have to do try and reach them with any tools after that because there's so little play room to play here, you, you can't get tools in there without scratching something. So that's the first side almost done. Little bits of Evo Gold spraying around the uh, workshop there. That's no problem. Right, so there's my one side done. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run down here with this not very mar permanent marker, but I'm just marking the outside edge. Look, from looking above it, I'm, I'm marking the fingerboard along the uh, fret. And hopefully it will whoops, stay on long enough for me to mark it. You, if you haven't got a thin pen, you can use a permanent marker, which is probably more sensible, actually. It's a thicker line, which is why I avoid it, but it, it equally is no use if I wipe this pen off before I get to it. Okay, so there's my length. So what I'll do is pick this one, pick this one up. I want to cut to that length exactly. So I'm cutting first and then undercutting second. And that should be my first fret undercut on both ed ends ready to go. And I'll seat it. If there's a tiny bit of overhang, I'll want a little bit on each side for the uh, for the ed edge beveling file to take away. Well, this doesn't feel very strong, this pliers. Oh well. So there you go, a little undercut on both sides. That's going to allow me to uh, bevel it all back and then I can fill with this, um, what do you call it, thing? Burn-in stick, a little resin stick that you can melt with a soldering iron and then get some filler into the end. And then once that's done, we can just um, put a little bit of poly over the whole, uh, the whole edge and tidy it all up that way. So it's slow, but satisfying work. Like I say, the, the frets are sitting in very easily. So um, my concern on this would not be that they uh, won't fit. My concern would be, if anything, that they're possibly, it might be a tiny bit loose, in which case I would need to reconsider the glue choice. Um, in my experience, super glue is a great <laughs> fretting glue um, because it works very quickly. And once you tap the thing down or hold the thing down, it's uh, it's where you want it to be, and that's the end of it. Um, it downside of it is that it's a bit messy. Uh, you end up usually having to um, scrape the fingerboard later on to clean up any spill. Whereas with wood glue, you can just clean it up with water and it's a nice, very nice clean up job. Um, super glue also seems to grip very strongly onto the wood, the rosewood, which is great for now, but it can make it induce flaking and pull out when you, or tear out when you come to, if you come to refret in the future, which I'm not sure this guitar will be around that far down the line, but um, it's you know it's a it's a consideration for some some instruments. 
Um, but it, it really is dictated by whether or not you know these, these slots feel right. They're, they're sitting in them right now very well. So I think by the time I come to tap them in with a little bit of wood glue, I think they'll probably be all right. Like I say, one or two, first one or two, I'll probably get a sense of whether that's any good or not. Um, now on other fretting jobs, I've, I've kind of beveled, uh, hand beveled each of them from, you know, off the guitar before I've even tapped them in. And it can do that, um, but I could, I've got access here with the beveling file, so it's probably better, the end beveling file, so it's probably better to leave that job to do as much, or leave that tool to do as much of that as possible, and only hand bevel the, uh, the ones I literally cannot reach with the tool. Um, okay. So it's a busy time at the moment. I've got I've got a couple of Pacificas. I seem to have done tons of Pacificas in the last couple of months. I've got two more coming in, um, both of them in for fairly substantial upgrades, which is in, unusual in a way that people don't often spend a lot on upgrading Pacificas, partly because they, I guess, they start out as reasonably budget guitars, and that's no dispersions on them. They're very good guitars. Um, but often it's not the kind of thing that somebody spends a lot on because maybe their logic is, or their reasoning is that they, you know, if they've got money to spend, they could buy something else. But both of these are in for new pickups. Um, one is a complete set of uh, iron gear pickups and the other one is a mix of iron gears and Seymour Duncan single coil in the neck for a good strat sound. Um, what else have I got? I've got a, uh, I think I'm pretty sure I've got a, a uh, oh my goodness, what's that one called? How far? Off? A thingy thingy. Oh my goodness, I literally it slipped my mind. Uh, Levinson Blade, that's what it's called. Levinson Blade probably coming in. I've got a, a SG lined up somewhere for some upgradey work um yes so plenty plenty of stuff lined up okay so first of all here's all the all the frets cut to size and fit tid now realistically let me just find the file the edge beveling file is going to only effectively reach a certain area in here. Um, so it's going to get to, let's see with me, probably with this bit of foam getting in the way, it's probably going to leave me with all of these. So everything at the line and backwards is going to need to be edge beveled. Um, and to do that, I'm going to need to fit the Dremel into. Uh, put the drum into a vice and it's going to be a bit noisy so I probably won't bore you with the excitement of doing that. Now where is, if we're at it, where so is, this is the problem of being messy, right there's a Dremel sanding drum, that will do there. And missing a Dremel grippy thing, which is somewhere on this table, but I have misplaced it, so I'll have to use something else. Sorry about this little pause. Sometimes plugs just don't want to come out of the thing. Can go there. Can go there. Back in a sec. Oh, and I've got three, looks like three left-handed strats or 
possibly Telecasters to make. I haven't even opened the, the kit box yet. Right, let's move this Gibson acoustic out of the way for a minute. And let us take our frets. Okay, so uh, let's grab that one. Now I'm going to take it across to my spinny thing. Bevel gauge on there. And on there. So I've got a good enough bevel, you can't really see it. It's about a 30 degree bevel on each end and the, it warms up a bit so you don't get long to do it before it gets too hot. So the trick is to get it in there and go, is that the right size? Does it need a little bit more? Um, what you can do is if that isn't satisfactory, you can get a block of sandpaper of one or two different grades. Um, and if you want to be really precise, you can get the offending item. And you can do the similar sort of thing here, holding it manually. It's a little, a little bit smaller gauge, this one. So it's, it's a bit harder to hold on to, but you can put a sort of um, bevel on it and you can soften it off the other end and then it's just a matter of really doing it either end until it feels like it's the right sort of fit um, but there you go it, you know a number of ways to do it the dremel or sandpaper both are effective either and if you really wanted to you could kind of go different go further with the sanding to get it really smooth but we will have to get up this end with uh, a file at some point but for now I just want it to fit without clearly evidently sticking over the edge so it's um it's a sort of let's see do one of these from scratch see how easy it is to put the angle on it and this is sort of from experience just just choosing an angle and going for it that bad at all but like I say you can you can do it with the Dremel if you're in that sort of mood and you can see pretty quickly how much you've got left over now this is a bit too much left over so I'm going to use the Dremel on both ends So at this stage, it's better to be a little bit under length than it is to be over, at this end anyway. Um, and that one is just about right, actually. So I would just soften it on this. This is 240 grit, I think, which is quite low grit, or high grit, if you know what I mean. So there you go. So I think just um, guessing, judging by how how much the overhang is. Um, it'd be nicer if the thing was a bit closer, but it isn't. And of course, I only have to do it for this top set. I can do the rest. Um, with the edge beveling block. But you could, you know, if, if you don't have that beveling block, you can do all of this by hand, um, you know, manually. And then well, you won't get quite as straight a line um, when it comes to it, but it still feels pretty good, actually. You can, you can get very, you can be very accurate with it. So you can see that obviously 
these are ready to tap in. Um, the, this, these here, I have to get much closer to the correct size before I tap them in because you can't reach them with the edge beveling device. So this is the, the sort of fiddly bit right now. But they, they all feel, actually it could be a little tiny bit off there as well. The angle is just something you sort of get used to when you become kind of familiar. It's, it's, there's no jig or anything to make it exactly perfect. Whoops. My clumsy fingers in there. There we go. Good, good. first started fretting I realized how much I enjoyed it it's something that I definitely definitely wanted to do again um, it's giving a, a new lease of life to an old neck That's what I enjoyed most about it. Um, you know, to, to see something that was either given up on almost, or just so old that it was, you know, couldn't be played anymore. Um, brought back to life and given a whole new future ahead of it. That's really um, rewarding to do. It's, and it's, it's rewarding just generally, but it's also um, kind of rewarding there's a sort of an environmental environmental aspect to it as well which is not the primary thing but it's, it's it fits with what I care about anyway um, so it becomes a sort of an approach that I would like to take even if I didn't have to sort of thing and this one just needs a little bit more there with these hand shaped ones. Two more ends. And then we'll do all the tapping in. We'll sort of check it, make sure it's working as we go. And then that will be it for the night. Very good. Okay, so here comes the fun part. So first lot, we're going to be tapping straight onto here and we, we're not gonna hit it hard. Um, so we don't need a load of support under there. It's not a, a particularly dangerous situation. So first thing I'm gonna do is Chuck on some glue and run it into the slot. Now we can afford to spill over because it wipes up so easily. It's not really a problem. It's on the edge of there. Okay, so here we go. This is just now about getting this 
into place in a way that we can feel that it's as well placed as it can be. And then it's a matter of getting the 14 inch radius edge, which is, ah, that's the only other thing that might happen. <laughs> Let's make sure it doesn't put all these down here. Yes, normally I don't hit them with the fret sitting on the neck like this. Okay, so these particular ones here now harder to get off because they're so flush fitting. Put them in a the second row here. Okay, right, so straight away we've got the fret. I can see that it's seating pretty well. Um, I can take a cloth and swipe it down there like that. Get a bit of tissue paper and clear up any excess that I can get hold of. So this will no doubt go down a bit more. And that looks okay to me. And the question really is how well that will seat and set. Um, and I have a feeling that's going to be all right. So a final sort of clean up over the top like that. The other frets doesn't matter if they get a little bit wet. Oops. So there we have. Please work. That's not that one. And if you've got fingernails, you can sort of get in up the edge of the fret there. So first feel, that feels nice. That's gone in well. Um, so now we can, we can do a few more in a row. Um, we just have to manage the drying glue as we do it so it doesn't end up sticking on the fingerboard that we've spent so much time making nice and uh, clean. This I'm discovering has some dust in there as well, so I'm going to make sure this is fully cleaned out. Otherwise, thank you. Uh, we'll just be trying to put frets in on top of obstructions, which we cannot afford to do. Remind me to just run this through here on all of these first. See, there's a bit of dust still left over. Okay, so let's put on some more glue. It's actually quite difficult to get into the slots, so just I end up kind of wiping it down there and kind of pushing it in as I go. But it's not the easiest thing to do. run over spill we're going to get all of the uh, these pre tailored frets in in one go now and we'll just manage the wet glue so it doesn't dry up on the on the rosewood that's the main thing okay wrong way that way so here we go placement placement yeah falling on sideways and that doesn't help okay 
Okay. In the olden days, I used to um, clamp down these frets overnight if I put them in with wood glue. But actually, I learned that, in, well, certainly in my experience, that if they're not seated properly when you start, then wood glue isn't going to hold them down. Um, So trying to persuade them to stay down with, with uh, you know, wood glue or any kind of glue isn't a good idea, unless about the only kind of glue that will do it is, as I mentioned, super glue, and that's a sort of if you must kind of situation. So what I'm doing here is I'm I'm taking off the bulk of the spare glue, but I'm also keeping the surrounding areas wet so that the cleanup will be straightforward. Um, can do a bit of paper cleaning up, followed by a bit more wet cleaning up, and then a bit more tapping to make sure everything's seated as well as it can be. Don't want to throw too much water on it, as in we don't want to soak let the water kind of thin the glue out and run too far into the, the whole affair. So. Excess glue jumping up there. Again, having the um, tape on here is great because it gives me no worries, and I don't have to worry about getting uh, glue spilling off onto the work of the guitar top. Not that it's difficult to get away anyway, wood glue being the most easily controlled of all glue spills, really. Um, so just the bit that I can't reach with the tool, I'm just looking to make sure everything's seated as well as it can be in there. So at this point, I'm going to give it a, an eyeball down the it actually looks fantastic actually that's really good i'm very, very happy now i'm going to now move on and we're going to put in all the rest of the frets now this is going to lift now the guitar slightly off the ground and we're going to be kind of hitting down on, on supported uh, wood wherever we go so i'm going to do more in a row because there's no there's no real need to go slowly with this it's not like it is any advantage in drawing it out um, other than being able to clean up each one as you go, but as you can see, we can we can pretty much clean up a whole row of them as long as we've got wet cloth standing by to do service. Now these don't have to be positioned quite so per perfectly because we're planning to chop these back um, using the end beveling file. But one of the things, if you're if you're not confident about the tightness of the grip, and if you are thinking that you may have a situation where your frets are looser than fitting looser than you perhaps would like I mean if the problem is you see if they're too tight it's a it's a matter of space if they're too tight um, it means the the uh, tangs are going to prise open the push the slot further apart and you're going to get the neck will eventually the sum of all those little extra widths of tang will add up into pushing your neck backwards in a curve so you'll get a kind of back bow, artificial back bow, which you could do without, really. So that's what you don't want. Um, the a benefit of, um, what was I going to say? Oh yes, the benefit of, if, if you are, if you're not sure that your frets are all, you're fitting, gripping very well, and you're nervous about it, 
um, using the fret end beveling tool is a bit worrying because it sort of, to begin with, it does knock the frets a little bit sideways as it does its work. Um, so I've always been, if I, if I wasn't confident they were seated properly, I'd be nervous that the end beveling tool will kind of push them and break them, you know, loosen them up and knock them out of position. So it's always been something I've been nervous about. Okay, let's, so a so central tap, one either end. See, the thing is, if you use paper to begin with, you see what happens, it dries almost instantly. So you, you then have to rush in with the wet cloth just to safeguard the surface from turning into a, like a PVA covered surface. So you kind of wet everything up again and then you have to work again with the with paper. before you even get the fingernails into it. So this is just sort of getting the bulk of spare glue out. But what we also then need to do is to go back and give it another tap. So it's always good to remember where you where you started this sequence. So it'll be there. And then we go in and hit it again. These were just made quite crudely from uh, copying a copying a radius, drawing a radius off one of these little radius guides onto a block of oak and uh, basically band sawing it and sanding it. So it doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, the reason it works as a leveling technique is because you basically as long as you hit the fret with something smaller than the fret and something softer than the fret, uh, it'll it'll work. It'll be it'll be a good method to hammer them in. Um, so a little block of wood that's even flat flat ended doesn't even have to have the radius will do a pretty good job, um, which is what I recommend in my forthcoming ebook on how to do this. You know, um, fret leveling, fret leveling, fret refretting on a budget with zero cost tools and one of the zero cost tools is um, little wooden blocks to tap home the frets as I just have done here. The fact that I put a radius on them first is a it's kind of a bit of a luxury it's not necessary but it is it is necessary if um, it would be necessary if you make them longer than the, 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 the piece of wood wider than the fret is long which you, you don't want to do. Um, so I keep it, uh, I keep them short and you could be even shorter than this, maybe 20 millimeters is a good length for tapping frets or this long if you've got um, a radius on it as well. Okay, so you know, cleaning up you can kind of go back over however many times with your thumbnails that you feel like getting in. This glue will at worst dry mostly clear and you'd hardly see it. Um, it, it, funnily enough, it does tend to fill up the end gaps as well, even if you don't want it to. I, I kind of don't want it to this time because what I really want to have happen is that I, I can um, get in there in a minute with my burn-in stick, which is what I bought specially. Um, but I'll probably find that this wood glue's filled the... I won't do it today anyway, but when I come to it, I'll probably find that the glue has done what I can't rely on it to do any other time, which is fill the end, uh, end gaps. Okay, so another visual check. Um, right now, looking down into the light and, and sort of mapping everything down here, this is all looking pretty good. Is there anything standing up? I think there might be one, there's one down here sticking up. I'm just gonna double check it. Um, put it flat on its base again. It could be wrong. I don't really see anything moving at all. So I 
think that's as good as it's going to be. I think maybe I'm just hallucinating a bit. Okay, back onto the support. And then onto the final seven frets. And I'm going to do them as one big run and then go home into the windy night. So, yeah, the first time I ever did a refret, I probably chose one of the hardest things to do, and that was a vintage 1970s Fender Music Master. Music Master? Music Maker? Music Master. Oh, God, Music Maker. Master. Anyway. Um, and, and in researching that, uh, it, it, it told me, uh, oh, you, these are frets you have to knock out sideways because Fender installed them sideways. Um, now, it took me quite a while to figure out or work out any kind of logic. Um, and every, every video, interestingly, uh, that I saw on the subject was of you know, so-called expert people refretting similar aged uh, Fender guitars. And, you know, they were all going through this, oh, yes, it was, uh, the frets were driven in sideways by a special fretting machine that Leo Fender had. And uh, so, OK, you know, fair enough. Uh, it seems it seemed to me at the time incredibly unlikely that somebody would devise a way of pushing frets in sideways um, when you could push them down from above. You know, if you think about the logistics of pushing a fret into a slot from a side, a thin, flexible, bendy fret, it's pushing it along sideways into a, into a slot in wood. It seems almost beyond credibility that somebody would even try to do it, let alone make it a standard way. But the those in the know insisted this is how Fender did it. And there's, you know, those same people claim to have seen the existence of a machine that he did it with. And therefore, this whole thing about um, driving frets, taking frets out and putting them back in sideways seems to have been born. Um, but the funny part of the whole story was the people who were showing on their videos all about how you do this thing. Um, to, you, you exclusively went ahead, showed you how to remove the frets with uh, sideways, with great care and so on and so on. So I studied that, wanting to do it exactly right the first time I ever did it. Um, went, spent a lot of time studying it and um, and then I got to the part in the video, the way they came to refret, and guess what they did? Banged the new frets down from above. Which was quite amusing, really. So when you think about it, think about the arguments as to why, why would you do it from the side? Well, about the only possible argument I could find was that if you did it from the side, what you could do is you could actually push the tangs of your frets underneath the wood so that the wood was over them and retained them unlike when you drive tangs into the wood from down below you're you're hope you're relying on the wood to sort of expand and grip the tang um, whereas when you're driving in them from the side into a channel the tang cuts a horizontal groove through the wood but below the surface and that groove trap uh, if you like is the anchoring thing now when I kind of figured that out, it seemed a neat thing to do. You know, I could actually, if you know, if you really had a problem with frets falling out, if that was something that all musicians lived in fear of, I could then see, uh, I could see that was actually quite a cool, clever, uh, you know, ingen ingenious, ingenious solution to what must have been a dreadful problem of frets continually falling out of guitars. But um, then it just seemed to me that after all of that reverence that these refretting guitar techs showed then to then go and put the new frets in the old-fashioned way by just banging them in driving the uh, the tangs down into the wood with vertical cavities if you like uh, seemed to be completely to uh, defeat the object so what was the point in going all that sideways pulling out if you weren't going to reuse those sideways cut tunnels to drive new new tangs into um and of course, without this fabled Fender machine, there was no way on earth you, were go you or I were going to um, actually drive frets in from the side. You had to have this machine to do it, if, the, if such a machine really did exist. But you're never going to be able to do it with your own, your, your, your bog standard fretting tools. So given that no mere mortal in the 19, 19, 
1950, no, 1950s, when they had the machine, um, but no mere mortal all these years later has got such a machine to hand. So it seemed to me that there wasn't a chance that you could put the frets in sideways, in which case there was no point taking them out sideways. So all I saw was this um, homage, <laughs> homage, homage, Omar to a sort of mythical way, which seemed, oops, wrong way around, seemed really silly. Um, because you completely undid whatever Leo's mythical machine had achieved when you came to refret it. So, but being young and wanting to please, I wasn't young, but I was wanting to please, um, I went ahead and did it the sort of cap doffing way and drove the frets out sideways even though the intelligent part of me was going, this doesn't add up in my brain, but I'll do it anyway, because it's expected. Everybody seems to think that's how you've got to do it. So I'll do it so as not to incur the wrath of the conventional wisdom, the hive mind and all its, all its, <laughs> I don't know what you call it. It's a, I, I wouldn't want to yeah, cool down the wrath of the hive mind, simple as that. So I did it the sideways removal way and uh, with all the trouble that entailed and the frets came out and I felt grand for having done it the way that the people on the YouTube said to do it. And as a, you know, as a first uh, ever fret job, I was eager to get it right, of course. And um, yeah, it turned out really well even though I, guess what, hammered the frets in from above or tapped them in, I pressed them in, I think, from above using my new press over there at the time. And um, yeah, and it was years later that I really thought through this whole business of the uh, sideways thing and, and figured out there was absolutely no point at all in honoring or, or adhering to that process if you didn't adhere to it the whole way through and in both both sides of the, process on both ends of the process. I'm just making absolutely sure these end bits are seated, which I think they are. This all feels all right to me. comes out at that point but when you don't see any come out you know there's hardly any movement at all no movement there we are and then a quick view down down the whole length again hey, let it rip i don't know what engine that is it's a bike engine that looks right now the only thing that's not right is the edges wobble as you get around here but that's going to be cut back when this is set and dried game set and dried and we got some we got some uh holes there we can then fill with the burn-in sticks which i'm looking forward to using so there we have it evo gold uh installed refretted leave it uh we won't actually leave it dangling there we'll leave it on its own back we'll leave it there to set to dry <laughs> dry overnight and uh, come back to it tomorrow after i've done a bit of a, a clean up this is going to look very dry until we come back and finish it all off but then we'll clean it with oil and then we'll oil it a bit more as well to make it all lo lovely and happy all right thanks for watching this hello welcome to back to help a bit of stuff welcome welcome back to finishing off this finishing a fret job on this here washburn from the olden days the good old washburn classic so just moving a few things around i have a one humongous great tidy up still to do um i promised the but i have it to do and i will do it but right now i am just a little bit running on untidy which i know you'll forgive me for 
I'm always on, on tidy, that's the truth of it. So a big pile of tools at this end and my mirror to tell me what I'm doing in recording and I can see what I'm doing, which is good. Right. Okay, so here we have a bit of glue on there that needs taking off. Um, here we have, I'm just thinking, oops. Yeah. Um, here we have the guitar, the fretting done yesterday. And now we're going to get the deadly block of doom onto it to trim it back. And I've got a limited reach on here. Um, I think I'll just get hold of the other bit. So this this device, this uh, end beveling file, I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll support it a bit like that. The end beveling file, its purpose is to bevel the end, obviously, um, but we'll, we'll trim the ends back first and then we'll concentrate on uh, beveling a, an angle on it. So straight away, it's quite difficult because they're all slightly different lengths. So we sort of start with a bit of a, an uneven cutting going on. It's going to be noisy, so don't go for me. But we cut them pretty close, so there's not a lot of material to take off, thankfully. secret of this is when you start cutting to cut very slowly or carefully to begin with and then increase the pressure as as the um, fret ends get closer to a uniform length um, you can see it's cutting up some fret metal but it's also cutting on the edge of the finish as well which is going to do um, and we'll we'll take care of that what we want to be able to do is to ensure that we've got the right angle on it so I'm now leaning over to bevel a bit of an angle. So that's a bit of a now the question of what angle sort of depends on preference really. So it's a bit of a judgment call. And when you are right down on this last fret before the body, you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of run up to it so you have to kind of push in a bit more and lean on it but you can see it's cutting the material the front material which is good um, and we're getting a nice finish now let's say it's taking a little bit of the material but we'll we'll sort of go over that with some uh, some poly on the edge of this anyway so again sort of the secret of this I find is to ensure that the, you keep this thing from riding up and over. Now it's difficult because I'm having to hold, hold the neck at this end as well. Um, so I'm having to kind of just be very careful. There's no chance of this riding up and over. does it scrapes the living daylights out of the new frets and that sort of defeats the whole object of refretting them because you're gonna have to well you're gonna have to re or level them to clean up all of that uh, scratching that you put on which is a costly business in terms of fret metal now just having a feel of these they are now all of a good length and there's no sticking up sticking out going on uh, right down to even these because I cut these the right length. So they're, they're still obviously a little bit sharp, so we need to concentrate on um, tidying them up still. But I would say that these all look nicely trimmed for sure. Maybe a little bit of a little bit more trim at this edge. End. The ends are always the bit that just tends to get slightly overlooked um, because you can't put the same pressure or same force into it uh, when you get to the end okay I'm happy with that that's one side trimmed 
is a you know it's a, a testament to having done the cutting the things as close to length as we possibly can before we go into the um, into this process with the block. Okay, so again, concentrating on cutting back. I'm going to put a bit of black tape on here just as a buffer. Um, just helps me feel confident that we can run into the edge here without. Oops, don't want too much. Run into the edge without any great fear. This this is a quite a nice thick buffer of a material. So the reason I'm taking it very carefully are these first bits where they're really uneven is I don't want to bash into these and push them in any direction because they're not they're not going to be so deeply firmly embedded that that they won't you know that they won't move and that's what we want to avoid so I'm very gentle at this stage I say we're trying to avoid that. Whew. So it's a, it's a nice stage to be at. I like this part of the process. Well, it's also quite scary. at this point and I can see it cutting into the, the poly on the edge which is fine as well because I've redone this uh, these or made dots here so we're going to need to poly over those dots anyway um, which is kind of cool I've got bits of glue still on different places but they'll we'll do a sort of polish over with the, the um, what's it called scratch remover cream anyway now I'm putting a bit of a, a little bit of an angle on it. And this is where I'm really concentrating hard on keeping the forces downwards so that it doesn't jump up sideways and go off, uh, skipping off sideways, which we don't want. yourself that what you need here is repetition not excessive force and it's tempting to push harder to get it to cut more when really we just need to keep it as light as possible and re, you know um, do repetitions This fingerboard has some, some uh, blemishes, some marks and stuff. Some of it will clean up. 
I buff, buff this out so we can we can go over with the polish and it will clean up. Um, what I think I'll probably do is I'll add the poly, sand it back, and then maybe buff it one more time. Uh, it might not. On the other hand, it might just polish it out. Um, so that's feeling good. Um, okay. So I think I'll just freehand. Uh, Run it down a couple more times here, just to be certain. It's not a very good view for you, I, I get it. <laughs> um, that's that one done, and I'll go down here. fret done in place now these still feel sharp because they are sharp they're they're beveled flush so the next thing we're going to do is take this this little fret end beveling file um looks i'm not even looking at my camera view oh yeah it's not bad i can see what's going on so what i'm going to do now is just round off the edge, edge of these frets. Now how you do it is a sort of personal thing. You can, there's a sort of, you can, you can do it a certain angle that you like, or a low angle, which sort of does the same thing, but softens the amount that it cuts. So what we'll do is we'll just, we'll just take off the square edge of the sharp edge of these frets and then a bit later on we'll sand them out a bit more to soften them out as well so it's a sort of progressive process feeling my way along fingers are your best guides Yeah, this is downside here is the, the edge that the sensitive part of the fingers are going to be playing certainly um, playing the right hand side now this is another area where we have this is why the, the tape is really good because it's very hard to use this file here and do the job without slightly running off and kicking into the um, the top here but we can do it by reducing the angle um, but also having this tape here in case donk, we run off and hit it so it'll protect us from that so really we're concentrating on softening up these edges so the whole thing feels as good as possible now while we're on this side um, it doesn't hurt to use the other file on it and in some ways we don't really need two files but we can this one here is a little file that allows me to just to take off any burrs of any kind that the previous file in, left on the proceedings but actually when you, you kind of get in there it's at this point it's pretty softened what happens is if you whatever flat surface you run down here with whether it's the end beveling file or whether it's a, in fact a, a new piece of sandpaper with some uh, with a block sorry a block with sandpaper on that can also recut a sharp edge on these and so the minute you recut a sharp edge you're sort of in a place where you probably need to soften the uh, faces off again because it's the sharp edge to these different faces that give you the sharp uh, feeling and it kind of turns it into that one's actually a bit short but we'll live with that yeah, very rare that you're going to get up there and play but so looking up close now I can just see um, because I did these manually that one oops hit the tape um, I probably did that one about three quarters of a millimeter short um, but I don't think it's it's going to have enough of an impact to be worth replacing for um, any particular reason I mean we could 
could replace it at this point in time if we're feeling oh, it isn't perfection isn't it? Um, let's have a quick look shall we well, let's cut one so we've got the option it's the one that joins the joins the body um, so I'll cut it extra long we've got glue still in here but the glue is still alive well you know what just for the sake of peace of mind to be perfect I'm going to remove it um, and I'm going to replace it now this is going to cause me probably some uh, need to clean out the slots a bit more feels like it fits it's fitted in pretty well actually now the reason that I personally never like to reuse uh, I never like to reuse a fret if I've taken it out then it, in my book it's going to get chucked now somewhere I put a couple of little I had a file I knew it was there this little file is the one that I use for um, just sanding, sanding, cleaning up one particular part, but I can't get there with this angled file, so I'm going to cheat and bend it back like this <laughs> and then use it like so. So this is my way of just cleaning back up that surface. You know, bearing in mind that whenever we take out a fret, there's a, there's a degree of, um, oops, now which one did I just cut and which one? What is wrong with me? I've just cut one and pulled one. <laughs> there's the one I just cut. Oh, okay. That's the one I pulled. Yep, and there's the one I cut. Right. Um, yeah, this this when you when you pull a fret out, you'll always you are always going to get uh some kind of surface grunge. So this is about doing my best to clean that up without Kind of sanding the whole fret we don't we don't want to introduce a sort of different look to that particular fret so it's so i've made this as a a thin file sandpaper file and it's made from uh, a piece of actually quite a, a large jumbo fret which has been bent backwards um, which does a, a pretty good job now i'm looking for the thing to clean this up a little bit because i need it to sand a bit better because it's Still got a little bit sticking up. This is probably a slightly tighter radius as well because I did this for um, another guitar. Did I do it or did I do it for this one? No, maybe I, oh, I'm losing track. I've done so many recently. Uh, okay, so we've got a little, if we've got a little bump here, what we can also do is we can break off one of these uh, little blade pieces. Um, can give ourselves a little surface to scrape across the top here that will help just to flatten things down so that we want as smooth as possible to ensure as smooth a seating of the new fret as possible all the stuff I've talked through before so that's just um, that's me doing a perfectionist thing and I, I you know I do like it to be the most perfectest it can be you know, a little bit of uh, glue and stuff still clogging that up so a little bit of working on this and that this is by the way because well, there's a couple of reasons partly this, this is because it's um, it's fresh relatively fresh fresh glue so you know it, while it's 24 hours and that's enough time for it to set um, it, it can this glue can can stay liquefied for quite a long time I've found um, if it's in a space rather than you know if it's two pieces of wood uh, put together it can be very quick so I'm just doing my best to clean this out again so that we are sure that we've got no obstruction so I'm having to do a little bit of digging because I can feel it running over the slightly damp uh, glue or the clustered clogged glue under the bottom of this um, and it would probably wouldn't be a problem but I don't want to leave any anything to chance I don't want to feel anything at the bottom of this slot before I put the next fret back in that's just asking for trouble so you know, if I'm committing to 
replacing this, I want it cleaned out and working perfectly from the outset. So I keep changing over which end of this I'm using because they sort of do different things. Um, this sharp end backwards is very good for cutting in and moving these sort of sticky blobs that are stuck in place. Okay, so I'm going to do the same basic thing with this one is I'm going to undercut it, I'm going to trim it with the trimmers and I'm going to cut it and bevel it precisely with the, um, the Dremel over there and soften it off if necessary with uh, some sandpaper. So just a repeat of the same process and this time I'll just focus very much more carefully on getting it to the right length. I mean, there, you know, some of them are tiny they vary in length here because putting them on is also quite difficult so it's hard to even get them absolutely balanced but that's the, that's the deal so mark it up cut it back and cut and then we'll go and bevel so to give the noise for a minute. Good. So this one is it's okay in a sense because I'm not, I'll tap it in, clean it up and we'll call it done because um, I don't have to worry about leaving it. I mean, it's going to stay in place and then the glue will harden or set over the next couple of hours. But we don't have to sort of put necessarily panic and put the guitar aside simply because um, when we tap this in, everything else, including that, is at the right length. So we can just carry on working it as if it's done and dusted, um, thankfully. So you can, you can feel once you've put glue in this, even though, like I say, it dries as a joint between pieces of wood very quickly, you can feel it softens the, um, the what's the word, the slot sides up. You can feel that what's in there is a little bit softer, i.e. it's had something in there with a the water component. Um, Fine. A little bit of damp cloth here. Yep. So let's put this in here. So I'll put it in and I'll um, basically tap it in place and we'll clean it up like before. This is now resting on the edge of this, so I'm confident I can do that without any support issues. Pick up the excess possible. Oop, oop. The trouble with these things, I've got Velcro on everything, so that picked up the neck rest, courtesy of the Velcro on the side of the neck rest. So the cloth wanted to drag it off. Okay, so that's that. I'll just tap this down one more time everywhere. So now what I know is that because this is pretty well in, um, I can, if I want, include this in an all over fret level that I might want to do at this point. So there's a couple of things we can do. The thing about, the thing about acoustic guitars in my experience is we, I can leave this and uh, wait till we've put strings on, get the action set exactly right, put strings on and so on, and then use the, uh, use the precision leveling approach with the banana tool or uh, we can we can sort of mark up the frets now and do a radius block fret level um, from the off and uh, the reason why that's possible to do is that in my experience I have some sugary drink I've got the shakes the hippie hippie shakes 
sorry about that, my product placement. Um, acoustic, acoustic guitars, in my experience, tend to play really well, even with uh, a very low, technically low, no, sorry, relatively high action compared to uh, an electric guitar. So I would be aiming to have this be playing well at about two millimeters at the last fret um, on the low E side and at most 1.5, sorry, at least the least, the lowest 1.5 on the um, high E side. So you can have quite, but it, relatively speaking, it's a higher action than, than an electric guitar. Um, now I've lost track of where I was. I was on one side, wasn't I? See? Um, anyway, so, so, uh, so it's possible to just, in verticons, just use a radius block and do this leveling. Okay, so I've done all that side and I'm just coming up here to soften that off. I think we've done everything else. Yep, now we're on the other side. Yeah, so depends on how it feels. We could put a fret rocker on there right now and, and sort of test it out and see what it feels like. Um, uh, and it'll give us an idea of how even or uneven it is. But like I say, the action we go for is higher than an electric, so it's, it's more forgiving of uh, any underlying uneven frets. But that doesn't mean to say I want to go into this with uneven frets of any kind. It just may be that you know, we don't know as we're fretting, we don't yet know what the relative levelness is like. Um, we have a fair idea from looking down the neck, but it isn't, you know, it's neither scientific or conclusive. And there's the fret I've just put in, I'm getting a fret end rounding off, and here I'm doing it now with yesterday's frets. So this process with the files tends to leave some telltale marks on the fingerboard and that's often what you can see uh, that a, a luthier or guitar tech has left behind. It's kind of in, almost impossible to, to use this kind of file without leaving little diagonal corner marks. Um, but you know, that's the sort of the little marks you can look out for often tell you what's been done to the fret ends. Okay. So I'll go back over this with the little single file thing. Okay. It's looking good. <laughs> Funnily enough, I've actually got this bit now looking a bit longer. Um, so if you if you have that and that, that feels odd, then you can you can employ things like this to bring this into the business and, and use that to take it back a little bit if you need to. And we've got uh, we've got the sides protected, so we can use this just to take back that one fret a little bit. If it's, if it's too long. There we go. Right. And same here. Again, it's, it's all protected off. And this way we can we just pick up any of the, uh, the other bits. If we think they're a little bit long with the bevel isn't quite right. So sanding is as good a way of as shortening things as um, filing is. It's the same sort of game, really. Right, cardboard square. That's from the Evo Gold from yesterday. I came in and I saw it and it confused me. I should have said to myself, watch out, it'll trip over that in a minute. But I didn't. Right, so um, done the top side. Now we're going to go 
not a very good view, I know, but you can go down. Sorry, this is the nether. It's the underside, isn't it? A bit down there with this. It's got, this has got one safe side um, that doesn't cut into the wood. So that still leaves this little occasional little skid stripe to let you know that you've been down there. Have I done this side already? I have a feeling I have. It's this side I want to do, isn't it? Starting up here. Now so I've done that. This, uh, the little marks will pretty much disappear when we put oil on the fingerboard and kind of rub that in. But you know, for the time being, you, you do see these little shiny bits where the metal of the files touch the wood. Because it sort of compresses it a very small fraction and shines it up a little bit. Okay, so after this, basically, we, we'll sort of check and have a C what the fret level looks like um, and I think if it's something that if it's easier to do it with a 14 inch radius block since that's the radius we've, we've uh, fitted them to then uh, it's a sort of toss up between do we kind of uh, do we impose a 14 inch radius on all of these I mean it's close to that anyway and it's in fact that's what we've fitted them to and that's what we've radius to but actually the even when you radius the board it's never precisely mathematically 14 it's always a little bit different because you know your hand and the block behave slightly differently so what you end up with is something that um uh is pretty close to the frets but maybe very slightly um mismatched or not matched so we have a there's my metal my triangle thing it's hanging up. It used to be around here somewhere. Could do the tidying up. Um, there's a strip in the way. Okay, well, somehow, somewhere, my uh, rocker thing, I've used one of them as a uh, I've used one of them as a file of sorts. But the other one is still around for use as a fret rocker. But right now, I couldn't tell you where it's gone. It's somewhere in the midst of this rubbish. Needing tidying up. Um, well, okay. Go so for now. That's not available. Um, I've got this one here, but that's unfortunately this one's got paper on it. I've been using it, so it's not the best. Uh, leveling uh, best device but and it's it won't work as a, a rocker very well so I think what we'll do is I will go ahead and I will be I'll do the thing with a mark it up and do a, a radius block level with the, the stuff that's already on the uh, on the block which is over here somewhere well, Gina, put it back. Um, it's a I mean that's a quite a so you could say like that's a really heavy duty um, thing if you've got, and this is probably about 60 or 80 grit, so it's too too chunky. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some uh, 400 grit on here, um, wrap it round, and we'll just use that to do this test. And what this will show me pretty quickly is what the relative levelness of these are. And if we can get it um, feeling, looking relatively level, then we could probably not have to use the uh banana to do a precision level because a general block radius block level won't usually be enough i'm knocking these off left right and center here which is my, <coughs> my, my sh workshop seems to be full of tusk things hanging up it's like a collection of a shop for tusk really okay tries to get one sheet out gets two. Come on there for a minute. Okay. 
So here's our 400 grit, which is about what they would use on the banana anyway. So I can now run down here. I know this is flat because I started it out being flat. So it's running down the frets now. I'm gonna have a look and see how it cuts. Um, as I said many times before, the uh, whether or not when you when you refret or when you fret a guitar, the chances of getting a level uh, fretting are nigh on none. Um, maybe one in twenty-five or thirty, something like that. I'm uh, really looking for my fret rocker. I'm going to improvise for a minute. Um, this is a this is a scraper. Um, won't get me to there, but it will get me to here. Some of these, just as a, a guess or a sort of a sample. That's not bad. It's very close. In fact, we hardly need to do much more before that will be ready to just uh, polish out and restring. So, yeah, when you when you press in or tap in frets, it's highly unlikely that you get a level set. Uh, your first go of tapping in, simple as that. Um, there we have it, that will do me. Yeah, very, very rare indeed. Um, just because it's mechanical, really. Um, I've, I've, I've occasionally got it and it feels like, way wonderful. You know, you hit the jackpot getting level frets, but as I say, one in 25, 30, something like that. That's just, that's just more luck than anything else to get it, to get it so that you don't need to do any fret leveling and just carry on. Uh, it's annoying where that thing's gone because I would just like to test these. I suppose I could take this bit of sandpaper off here and use this one. Well, it's, itself is not the best thing. It's an aluminium one um, and it, can wear this one. I could, I could, I suppose I could flatten it on the. Since I've got no alternative at the moment, I'll do a quick flatten out on the block. So, let's put this down here a second. Yeah, so no, I don't feel at all inadequate that I have to do a fret leveling at all, just the way it is. This is not ent entirely precise, but it's it's a sort of a workable start point. Makes it, cleans it up a bit. The shorter one is the harder one to do. Yeah, um, I mean, realistically, we can go and do a little bit more, but that this this unevenness will be below the playing action for sure. So it's a little bit academic, but you know, having done that, I now can just prepare to polish out and not have to worry about doing a precision leveling afterwards. Okay, so where are we? We are at a tidy up stage. That's definitely where we are. I'm going to tidy up. Um, regards this now, we have the standard stuff to do next. 
Um, first standard thing is we've got to match up the nut. Um, I've been finding that a lot of these nuts are strangely difficult to match. Um, I can spend a lot of time checking specs on the, uh, the Tusk and other websites and, and you can buy them and they can just not be quite right. Um, for example, on the Takamine down there, I just had to make one from, from a block from scratch because it just wasn't nothing I bought for it. It was kind of non-standard, but nothing I bought for it would work. So I, this one's got a bit of tape on the front, um, silver tape, because I was using it to mark, try and make it work for the Gibson, not the Gibson, the Takamine. In the end, I gave up. So this is, this is unused, except for testing it for fit. So I'm going to clear that off and just start out by dropping it in there. That's actually lovely. It's lovely except it's too short in the, in the fatness stakes. Um, I don't think there'll be any another of the uh, nuts that will fit it in terms of depth. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of an SG nut which is the right depth. That's a left-handed, would you believe? <laughs> Whenever you want a left-hander, why isn't there one in there? So I've got a ton of things, but um, if you're going left-handed, no, if you're going this depth, it's uh, about the only way you're gonna get it is with a, a block. But I think this, in terms of uh, size and fit, that's absolutely perfect. So I would rather have this little extra gap here than spend months trying to find uh, a thicker, deeper nut, which is that sort of, well, isn't even that's not, even that's not deep enough. I'm gonna write left, left hand on here because I'm always on the lookout for left-handers because I keep struggling to buy them. If I've got one in the spares, that's important to know. Um, yeah, I mean, the alternative, what I sometimes do is I, uh, I'll pad, uh, pack them out or expand them from the back. But I have to say, this is about, first and foremost about functionality. Uh, I think um, not searching for a, a, a nut that doesn't really do what the tusk does because we could we could use um, there'd, be a, there'd be more variety in the bone nuts um, but all of these have a sort of tend to have a yeah fixed uh, this is a Gibson one yeah, well, they tend to be of a fixed thickness front to back they never actually say it very well information is pretty thin. The Gibson one comes with a little little uh, pin to stop it moving where you, that locates it which I think is quite cool. I've not actually seen that on anything. Uh, but yeah I can't I can't get it to I mean you can make a like I say you make a bone nut that would expand to that thickness but that's who wants bone eh? We're trying to make this thing play and stay in tune not fight with bone nut slots cut in bone. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I will go with that. It's a, it's a better, I mean, let's have a look at the, the actual dimensions of the original, which is a bone nut, and it's way thicker. I mean, it's, it's quite well cut and everything, but the whole point of going with a tusk is to have that dependable tuning stability. So like I say, sometimes I expand them outwards um, by gluing on some at the back, and then they, they sort of become a, uh, bigger got a hump on the back and they just fit the slot but I don't think that's I really don't think that's worth spending extra effort on um, this will play great as it is uh, right so thing to do that's now level I'm happy with that I'm gonna need to um, sand and polish those out which is a matter of uh, I'll do off camera because it's a boring process with sandpaper and so on. Um, what I want to do after that then is I want to gauge the action and set the height of this and the um, the first spread action. So it will be we'll focus in on these two parts after that. Um, there uh, and then the, the the sort of last thing in the mix really will be I'll chuck away the um, I use the old uh, set of strings I took off originally, which are somewhere there. 
and I'll use them to uh, get this height right and get the first fret action right and then I'll chuck them away and I'll take this home and I'll do the edge poly finishing at home over a few hours and cut over a day or evening or so. Oh, yeah, before I do that, I'll just end fill anything that needs filling on the edges of these, which shouldn't be a problem. Using my new wax burn-in stick thing. No, resin burn-in stick. Um, so the next thing, when I come back, the next time you'll see this is when this is done, oiled, ready to go, and we'll put the new strings on, put the tuners back on and get it ready to go. Okay. So that's it for now. Fret, fret, refret done. Fret leveling done. Well, okay, let's get this on the roll. Um, we are about to, I want some felts. Felts, I want strap button felts. We're about to string up this refretted, lovely old refretted washburn, converted from the right, no, left to right. It used to be left, but now it's right. So it's quite a, an interesting one, but this is Andy's washburn, and we are now putting it back together. Put the strings on. Um, so uh, quite a bit of the, quite a few things I've done off camera here. Like for example, I took it home last night and put on some poly on the edge of the fingerboard. Um, just to kind of, because I, you know, when you uh, yeah, trim the frets with the trim fret trimming stroke beveling block, you do get some cutaway on the uh, poly. So it's good to um, just build it back up a little bit. So that's what I did at home last night. And then I sanded it back like today with, uh, what they call that thing, micromesh. Um, and then just give it a little bit of a polish today. So it's not like full mega gloss, but it's it's nicely, it's a sort of satin feel to it. So now I'm putting on the elixir strings and um, this should all be nice and good. Get those strings to sit down. The pegs, it's, a no, it's very unscientific, these acoustic guitar pegs. There's nothing about it that's very modern or precision. You have to kind of, if you push the, peg, uh, the ball of the string all the way down into the guitar, it'll possibly spring its way halfway up because ultimately the ball of this wants to sit halfway up. Uh, so you have to sort of try and get it there first in order for it not to spring out and surprise you. So anyway, <laughs> that's how I describe it. So we are pretty much done, which is nice. Um, we'll put these strings on, trim them, stretch them out, and then that will be ready to uh, head back today. Um, take home, and then what else? Oh yeah, uh, well that's it for this one then. Um, and then all the acoustics, oh yeah, the acoustics are gonna come Two of them are going to come back here because Mark's coming up here tomorrow to get the other two. So by the end of tomorrow, two will be gone home and possibly, uh, depends what Andy's doing shortly after the other one, this one. Um, funny enough, I, one of the guitars that I just did, uh, the Gibson was so unbelievably dead sounding. Um, and part of it was, to do with the strings. Um, uh, is, it, um, is his name Dean? I think it was Dean, Mark's friend. Um, bought it, I, I think he just, he, he, he'd asked Mark if there was any chance I could save the strings, because I think he just put new ones on. But my God, they were awful sounding. I don't know what kind of strings they were, but they were thoroughly dead. So it really came to life with a new set of um, strings, particularly these elixirs were good for it. The problem with strings nowadays, is there are so many dodgy strings out there. Um, and my range of sellers that I will buy strings from is, is reducing all the time, particularly if they're more expensive ones, um, because you simply can't afford to spend 15 pounds or more, 17 quid nearly, for these uh, on fake strings that have cost 30p to make in a Chinese factory with a bit of fake packaging. 
because to be quite honest, there's very little way of knowing these days. And a lot of the sellers who are selling fake strings on eBay don't know they're selling fake strings. They would have got them at a, you know, a wholesale price, they think, and they'll be from the same fake source. So it's not good. Um, and the problem is when you flood everywhere with fakes, um, you just you're, you've got no chance. You have no idea what's real and what isn't. So um, now these I can tell these are decent elixirs. Certainly, um, I think I got these from Strings Direct, and I would hope they would be from a, you know a well-known company like that. But as I say, it isn't. I've, I've bought strings from sellers that I've trusted up to this point. And um, for example, I remember one seller I bought some from and um, they were clearly fake and I sent them back um, because they were rusty and horrible. I sent them back and the seller was great, you know, in the sense that they, oh, I'm really sorry, you know, um, what I'll do is, here you are, here's some new ones. I didn't get a choice, but they just sent me, without question, sent me a pack, another pack of the same things, which were also fakes. So there's just no point after that other than say, you know, just give them that sort of heads up and say, look, I, I'm not going to buy from you again because, you know, I don't doubt your decency as a seller, but you've somehow come across a whole load of uh, fake strings and you just can't, you know, there's no, I don't need them replacing. If I get fakes, I don't need more fakes, if you get what I mean. So, Difficult. This was difficult to fill the um, fill the fills on the edge of here because partly because it's a stained or yeah a tinted lacquer they put on here, and that means that when you come to sand off the uh, the end fill stuff, in this case it was a resin that I used. Um, the problem is you take the colour away or you risk taking colour away. painting job which isn't fun so. nicely in tune not so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to put this strap button this is the new strap button again I did this off, offline on offline um, so that's one thing that uh, Andy wanted me to do, was put the strap button on. I've had a, uh, I was just conversing via messenger just earlier on before I came up here with uh, an American customer who wants me to make a Rickenbacker copy for him. And um, I very much enjoyed making the, uh, the headless Rickenbacker tribute that uh, I made for myself. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to turn down work. So I've been very, I've tried to be very careful to say that um, the guitar, you know, I, I, I don't have a problem making a, a copy, um, providing nobody tries to, you know, we don't try and make out that it's a Rickenbacker. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure I really want to do too many direct copies, but then again, you know, he did, in a roundabout way, he bought one of my SG, or my MGs, which is, to all intents and purposes, an SG shape, with some differences, but probably not enough, you know, so much so that somebody would look at it and go, oh, that's an SG, but, um, so, I don't know, I kind of, it's, it's one of those things you just come across as a, a sort of new maker you know do do you make things that are direct copies or do you run a mile
tune, but. Need more stretching still, but. So, this is a, might make a small adjustment to the action here for the nut. into that one. <laughs> So final, final, final little details here. Let's check these first fret actions. I was kind of hoping, yeah, let's see what the height really is. I don't really want to adjust them if possible. I like to leave the slots as good as possible, but obviously with a, with a new nut like this, and it's not an adjustable nut, it's quite difficult to get them precisely right from the outset. So there is a bit of, room to go down there so it will make adjustments I'm gonna have to so let's just let's just get these one by one see that one's almost spot on so it's just going up a bit high on the uh, uh, that's right it's a 12 and a 14 so the nut is a 12 and the, and the uh, strings are 14 that's why so we're just getting a little lift at the edges or a gap opening up at the edges. I see, I see. So let's just, uh, let's just do a little adjustment here. Always makes the slot muddy, mucky. This one, those one, and those one. What's this one like? I used this one, this one before. Yeah, it's pretty good. This one, this sort of ellip ellipsis shaped one, is very good for cleaning out the slot if you make it dirty. I'm going on a four. 0.4 basis here, which is higher than an electric I would go, but I just want, I'd like to leave enough room uh, on the acoustic. Uh, so today's jobs, oh, where's my little brush gone? Today's jobs include finding the little brush. Here it is. Today's jobs include uh, finishing this. Um, then preparing the space for tomorrow's spraying. So tomorrow I'm going to be spraying purple, purple sprays. I'm going to be spraying the purple, uh, Adam's Purple Jazz Master, which is going to be good. So that's already painted in acrylic. And this is going to be, funny enough, the first first right on the mark the first um, <sighs> customer guitar painted with the new system so that's good 
Now the, the 52 cuts really well for some reason, the 53, sorry. I don't know why it's so good a cutter, but it is. So I'll just go straight in with that. Um, yeah, so painting uh, spray, not painting spray, clear coating spray tomorrow. Um, the the uh, humidity is supposed to be very low. Uh, around about midday onwards. And for a bit till about four or five o'clock. So we've got a good blast of low humidity, which is as good. Uh, a situation to do it in as any and I've also got control of the space as well a little bit with humidity with the heater and with the dehumidifier so all in all if we start with some low ambient humidity it's good um, makes it just easier to control it so I'm just being very careful to get this to where I want it because you know the big difference here is we don't get the ease of play if we don't get this down to the right height we It'll still be a difficult to play first fret action. Okay, that's a little bit of a gap. Do it quite big. Yeah, so that's tomorrow's fun. Spraying, spraying. Um, and then Mark coming up to pick up the, uh, his friend's guitars. So, it's going to be interesting for him to see the spray system in action as well although it's difficult well i suppose we've got more got more than one mask kicking around right. okay so everything's good here except we'll just double check the b and the <laughs> i say everything's good except the b and the e because of the difference in um slight difference in radius mismatch it's a small affair God awful small pair. Okay, that's good. The G is fine. This is just a tiny bit off. That's hardly anything to worry about. So I'm just going to use the slightest bit of a to go with the. with that tiny little go with the um, B notch file as I call it and this one will be just actually it's not as far out as I thought I'll give it a tiny go with this V notch as well just to just to open the slot up a little bit so that it doesn't grab the string at all it done so we've got everything we've got da -da -da -da. we've got oh the only thing that hasn't happened here which I'll do is just to now take off the uh, polystyrene no polythene that stuff that will stay on the scratch plate forever otherwise which is quite difficult to Get moving. <laughs> Done. That was some symbolic moment, by the way. You didn't, in case you didn't notice it. I'm just going to get the Thing to a note and then it's going in the bag.
I'm going to just, uh, if I can find the right thing, I'm going to just, I could, if I can get a good bite. Well, not with that meat. It's going to just flatten the neck a tiny fraction more. A fair amount of relief in it, which I now, of course, can't find a quick one. Let's just see if I can figure out which one it is. So we're nearly done. get a bite on the right side. Thank you. Good. That's a, that is as low as it's going to get um, without losing the the uh, what's that called the brake angle. We've got just enough brake angle over the uh, over the um, E saddle right now to play, but any lower than that, and we would lose it. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. The conversion with Bridge Doctor. The uh, actual the, the the back here is really quite a lot flatter now. Um, so we're good to go. We're ready. That's that's it. I'm ready to send back converted new gold frets. They look pretty as well. Oiled, um, slot reversed, intonated, and away we go. So it's been a, a joy to do, and it's now ready to go back to Andy. Um, although it didn't come in a case, it's going to travel home tonight in a case. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> big conversion later. Thank you for watching. Um, I hope I managed to put it together in the right sequence because it's really difficult to do. Okay, let's use the mirror to switch it off now. <laughs>